Chapter Two of the Ice Maiden and Other Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ellie Cat. The Ice Maiden and Other Tales by Hans Christian Andersen. The Ice Maiden, Chapter Two: The Journey to the New Home. Rudy was now eight years old. His father's brother, in Ronathal, the other side of the mountain, wished to have a boy, for he thought that with him he would fare and prosper better. His grandfather perceived this and gave his consent. Rudy must go. There were others to take leave of him besides his grandfather. First there was Ajola, the old dog. "'Your father was post-boy, and I was post-dog,' said Ajola. "'We have travelled up and down. I know dogs and men on the other side of the mountain.' It is not my custom to speak much, but now, that we shall not have much time to converse with each other, I must talk a little more than usual. I will relate a story to you. I shall tell you how I have earned my bread, and how I have eaten it. I do not understand it, and I suppose that you will not either, but it matters not, for I have discovered that the good things of this earth are not equally divided between dogs or men. All are not fitted to lie on the lap and sip milk, I have not been accustomed to it, but I saw a little dog seated in the coach with us, and it occupied a person's place. The woman, who was its mistress, or who belonged to its mistress, had a bottle filled with milk, out of which she fed it. It got sweet sugar biscuits, too, but it would not even eat them, only snuffed at them, and so the woman ate them herself. I ran in the mud by the side of the coach, as hungry as a dog could be, I chewed my crude thoughts. That was not right. But this is often done. If I could but have been carried on someone's knee, and have been seated in a coach, but one cannot have all one's desires, I have not been able to do so, neither with barking nor with yawning. That was Ajola's speech, and Rudy seized him by the neck and kissed him on his moist mouth, and then he took the cat in his arms, but she was angry at it. You are getting too strong for me, and I will not use my claws against you. Just climb over the mountains, I taught you to climb. Never think that you will fall, then you are secure. Then the cat ran away, without letting Rudy see how her grief shone out of her eye. The hens ran about the floor. One had lost her tail. A traveler, who wished to be a hunter, had shot it off, because the creature had taken the hen for a bird of prey. "'Rudy's going over the mountain,' said one hen. "'He is always in a hurry,' said the other, "'and I do not care for leave-takings.' And so they both tripped away. And the goats, too, said farewell and cried, "'Mit, mit, ma!' And that was so sad. There were two nimble guides in the neighborhood, and they were about to cross the mountains. They were to descend to the other side of the gemmy, and Rudy followed them on foot. This was a severe march for such a little chap, but he had strength and courage, and felt not fatigue. The swallows accompanied them a part of the way. They sang, We and you, you and us. The road went over the rapid Lusheen, which rushes forth from the black clefts of the glacier of Grindelwald in many little streams. The fallen timber and the quarry stones serve as bridges. They pass the alder bush and descend the mountain where the glacier has detached itself from the mountainside. They cross over the glacier, over the blocks of ice, and go around them. Rudy was obliged to creep a little, to walk a little. His eyes sparkled with delight, and he trod as firmly with his iron-shod mountain shoes, as though he wished to leave his footprints where he had stepped. The black mud which the mountain stream had poured upon the glacier gave it a calcined appearance, but the bluish-green, glassy ice still shone through it. They were obliged to go around the little ponds which were dammed up by blocks of ice. During these wanderings they came too near a large stone, which lay tottering on the brink of a crevice in the ice. The stone lost its equilibrium, it fell, rolled, and the echo resounded from the deep hollow paths of the glacier. Up, ever up, the glacier stretched itself on high, as a river of wildly heaped up masses of ice compressed among the steep cliffs. For an instant Rudy thought on what they had told him, about his having laid with his mother in one of these cold-breathing chasms. Such thoughts soon vanished. It seemed to him as though it were some other story, one of the many which had been related to him. Now and then, when the men thought that the ascent was too difficult for the little lad, 
they would reach him their hand, but he was never weary, and stood on the slippery ice as firm as a chamois. Now they reached the bottom of the rocks. They were soon among the bare stones, which were void of moss, soon under the low fir trees, and again out on the green common, ever changing, ever new. Around them arose the snow mountains, whose names were as familiar to Rudy as they were to every child in the neighborhood, the Jungfrau, the Monch, and the Eiger. Rudy had never been so high before, had never before trodden on the vast sea of snow, which lay there with its immovable waves. The wind blew single flakes about, as it blows the foam upon the waters of the sea. Glacier stood by glacier, if one may say so, hand in hand. Each one was an ice palace for the ice maiden, whose power and will is to catch and to bury. The sun burned warmly, the snow was dazzling, as if sown with bluish-white glittering diamond sparks. Countless insects, butterflies and bees mostly, lay in masses dead on the snow. They had ventured too high, or the wind had borne them thither, but to breathe their last in these cold regions. A threatening cloud hung over the waterhorn like a fine black tuft of wool. It lowered itself slowly, heavily, with that which lay concealed within it, and this was the fawn, powerful in its strength when it broke loose. The impression of the entire journey, the night quarters above, and then the road beyond, the deep rocky chasms, where the water forced its way through the blocks of stone with terrible rapidity, engraved itself indelibly on Rudy's mind. On the other side of the sea of snow, a forsaken stone hut gave them protection and shelter for the night. A fire was quickly lighted, for they found within it charcoal and fir branches. They arranged their couch as well as possible. The men seated themselves around the fire, smoked their tobacco, and drank the warm, spicy drink which they had prepared for themselves. Rudy had his share, too, and they told him of the mysterious beings of the Alpine country, of the singular fighting snakes in the deep lakes, of the people of night, of the hordes of specters who carry sleepers through the air toward the wonderful floating city of Venice of the wild shepherd who drives his black sheep over the meadow. It is true they had never been seen, but the sound of the bells and the unhappy bellowing of the flock had been heard. Rudy listened eagerly, but without any fear, for he did not even know what that was, and whilst he listened he thought he heard the ghost-like hollow bellowing. Yes, it became more and more distinct. The men heard it also. They stopped talking, listened, and told Rudy he must not sleep. It was the phone which blew, the powerful storm wind, which rushes down the mountains into the valley, and with its strength bends the trees, as if they were mere reeds, and lifts the wooden houses from one side of the river to the other, as if the move had been made on a chessboard. After the lapse of an hour, they told Rudy that the storm had now blown over, and that he might rest. With this license, fatigued by his march, he at once fell asleep. They departed early in the morning. The sun showed Rudy new mountains, new glaciers and snowfields. They had now reached Canton Valley, and the other side of the mountain ridge which was visible at Grindelwald, but they were still far from the new home. Other chasms, precipices, pasture grounds, forests and paths through the woods unfolded themselves to the view. Other houses, other human beings, but what human beings? deformed creatures, with unmeaning, fat, yellowish-white faces, with a large, ugly, fleshy lump on their necks. These were Cretans who dragged themselves miserably along and gazed with their stupid eyes on the strangers who arrived among them. As for the women, the greatest number of them were frightful. Were these the inhabitants of the new home? End of chapter 2